Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 18, familiar verse, but don't tune it out. Sometimes we get familiar with scriptures and we hear somebody say they're going to go to a passage of scripture and, and we're like, well, we know about that scripture. <laughs> and that's okay. Because the Lord says a lot of things through the word of God over and over again. <laughs> and we say, well, we just heard that at the last book of the Bible. Yeah, that's how we are, though. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, the Bible says here, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And we're going to look at that little phrase that says here, Be not drunk with wine. Be not drunk with wine. Father, help us tonight. Father, we surely, we surely don't need to be drunk with wine or anything else that can control our life. We need to be filled with thy spirit. Would you help us tonight? Would you help us with things in our life that we struggle with and really just the struggle's real, just being filled with your Holy Spirit. And that's really what we need to be thinking about and working toward, not so much the other side of this verse, but being filled with your spirit. And Father, would you help us tonight pinpoint some things in our life, encourage us as we deal with this subject, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So I think for... Maybe this week, next week, we'll talk about this being not drunk with wine. We might be talking about some more on the subject of, uh, of drinking. And the Lord just put on my heart to talk about this. Um, not that I think we've got a bunch of drunks here in our church. Um, but it also deals with anything in our life that the Lord can help us with. And so to be drunk with wine is to be filled with wine so that we are not able to be filled with anything else. That's the idea here. You're, you're filled with it. You're controlled by it. It's, that's what the pic, that's pictured for us here is the fact that the wine is controlling us. There's nothing else controlling us, just the wine here. So this is a command from the Lord. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. But the command is also to be filled with the Spirit. These are both commands. And uh, being controlled by wine here is representative of our flesh controlling us. Although I believe we ought not to be drunk with wine. But it's, we're going to see it and look at it in the context here of Ephesians 5 about serving God as one of his children. And, um, and so as we look at this, we're looking at the flesh as a whole uh, being drunk with wine is a small area of flesh. And that might not be your stumbling point in your flesh, but it's something else that you're drunk with. It's something else that you're controlled by. And it's not wine in your life. And, um, and so we can look at it that way tonight, and you can let the Lord give you an application there for that. It's because either we're being controlled by our flesh or we're being controlled by the Holy Spirit. That's it. You've got one or the other. If you look back over in Galatians chapter 5, sometimes I, sometimes I think, man, I, this is just too simple. I'm making things just too simple. <laughs> and I want to make things simple, but oftentimes I say things over and over again. I say, is it just too simple? It's so simple we don't get it. It's so simple we say, oh, yeah, yeah, I know that. And then we don't apply it by faith and don't believe it. But in Galatians chapter 5, and verse 16 and 17, the Bible says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So that comes first in that verse. If you walk in the Spirit, then everything else is going to take care of itself. Uh, usually we, we have the other way around, and uh, we're trying to take care of the lust of our flesh, and we're trying to figure out how to eradicate this flesh and how to kill it and how not to do this that we know the Lord doesn't want us to do and how to do this that the Lord wants us to do. And we're going to run ourselves crazy if that's the life we're living. If you're trying to say, I don't need to do this and I do need to do that, and you're, you're, you're working it. The command and what we need to believe and work toward is being filled with the Spirit. Walking 
in the spirit. Verse 17 says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. So today we're going to make the application not only to drinking alcohol, um, but also what accompanies that in this context of idea, also drug use. But again, it also covers all our flesh and all of our lust that can put us under bondage and in control of that thing. And so if we're to drink alcohol, then it would start to control us. Likewise, if you're, you are to take drugs, they would start to control you. Whether you knew it or not, it would start controlling you. And by the time you figured it out, it's already too late. It's already too late. And the Lord wants to control us, but he cannot control us if the alcohol is controlling us, and he cannot control us if drugs are controlling us, and he cannot control us if our flesh is controlling us, which is the big picture, and these other things are just smaller pictures. But what you do understand is that these things, the drugs and the alcohol, bring us under that control of them, just like any other lust that we have. In any other thing in our life. Now, this is the principle that we see in Ephesians 5, 18. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So I want to share with you some statistics about alcohol and drugs. So some alcohol statistics here. National statistics for youth and adults. With every drink, one shortens his life 20 minutes. There are 11 to 17 million drunkards in America. And that's probably too little. America spends $50 billion a year on alcohol. And that's probably too little in the number. Alcohol problems cost the U.S. about $69 billion a year. Meaning jobs lost man hours lost, accidents on highways. You know that nearly 20,000 people are killed every year in drunk driving accidents. That's a lot. The leading cause of retardation among children is alcohol consumption during pregnancy. 83% of all fire fatalities are alcohol related. 50 to 68% of all drowning uh, accidents are alcohol related. 80% of all suicides are alcohol-related. 86% of all murders are alcohol-related. Wouldn't it be better just to be filled with the Holy Spirit than to be filled with alcohol? <laughs> but it's not that easy for the drunkard. They might even admit that it's easier, would be easier. But they need help. Alabama statistics that are taken from the Pacific Institute for Research and Evaluation say this. Alcohol consumption by youth in America. And by youth, I mean 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, or basically from the range of 15 to 18-year-olds. These are the statistics here. 66.8% had at least one drink of al alcohol one or more days during their life. 22.8% had their first drink of alcohol other than a few sips before age 13. 39.5% had at least one drink of alcohol one or more, on one or more occasions in the past 30 days. 23.1% had five or more drinks of alcohol in a row, which is called binge drinking, in the past 30 days. 5.4% had at least one drink of alcohol on school property in the past 30 days. Well, that's probably not true for right now because it's summer. Well, they might have. They might have went on school property and done that. Uh, if I remember correctly when I was lost. Um, but those are staggering numbers. And those are probably too low. Those are probably too low. When I was in high school, I fell into all these categories. I was one of those statistics in all those categories. 
harm associated with underage drinking in Alabama. Now, these are some older statistics here. But in 2009, an estimated 30 fatalities and 722 non-fatal traffic injuries were attributed to underage drinking. In 2000, so we say, what's underage drinking? Anybody that's not 21 or older. <laughs> so in 2009, an estimated 39 homicides, 15,500 non-fatal violent crimes such as rape, robbery, and assault, and 35,000 property crimes including burglary, larceny, um, and car theft were attributed to underage drinking. In 2007, an estimated seven fatal burns, drownings, and suicides were attributed to underage drinking. In 2009, an estimated 576 teen pregnancies and 17,405 teens having sex were attributed to underage drinking. None of this is good. All bad. All bad stuff. It's not like the commercials. Not like the commercials. Drug statistics from AL.com News. The statistics here said one out of every 10 students in grades 6 through 12 in Alabama has used marijuana. One out of every 10. One out of every 20 students in grades 6 to 12 in Alabama has used uppers, downers, and inhalants. One out of every 30 students in grades 6 through 12 in Alabama has used cocaine, hallucinogens, heroin, steroids, ecstasy, oxycontin, and meth from grades 6 to 12. When I was in high school, I fell into all these categories. And these numbers are probably too low, just what's being reported. These statistics show that alcohol and drugs are a major problem with the youth in Alabama. And this isn't the only place. This is how it is around the world. Anywhere that kids are at and adults are at that can get kids things is like this all over the world. Alcohol is a serious thing. Drugs are a serious thing. Those are just some statistics I want you to think about. But... I want you to know this. We're going to go to Proverbs 23. We want to talk about the effects of alcohol and drugs. Because when the Bible talks about alcohol, the same things happen when you take drugs. And the same things happen if you're not on alcohol and drugs, but you're addicted to sin, which that's what we do. We get addicted to sin. It causes some of the same problems in our life. Uh, Proverbs chapter 23. And I'm going to go back to Proverbs chapter 20. And I'm going to read a verse here as we're finding our way to Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 20 verse 1 says this, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So no one, the Bible's telling us that it deceives us. Very deceptive. No one can handle alcohol. No one can handle drugs. It's deceiving us. No one can handle anything in our flesh. But our flesh would like for us to think that we can handle it. Yeah, what's a little alcohol? Yeah, what's a little bit of drugs? We're just going to have a good time. Yeah, what's a little sin? Which includes those. But what's just a little bit? You know... The fact that it deceives us, and it says if you're deceived thereby, the person that's deceived thereby is not wise, because it's going to handle us in the end. We think we can handle it, but in the end, sin is always going to handle us. Now look at Proverbs 23. Proverbs chapter 23, look at verse 29, beginning in verse 29. And we're gonna, what you're going to find here, we're going to have six brief questions here. Now, the context here is alcohol and someone getting drunk. Okay, we're going to see that. But this is the context. And you're gonna ha we have these six brief questions. Look at these questions here, beginning in verse 29. Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath babbling? Who hath wounds without cause? 
Who hath redness of eyes? So what's that talking about? Who hath woe? Who's, who's crying because they're in grief? They have misery. They have some despair about them. Who's this person that hath this woe? Who has sorrow? This pain of mind is produced by some loss or some disappointment in their life and they're drinking. Who has this? Who has this sorrow? Who has contentions? They have strifes and they have brawlings and they have strugglings. Who are these people that have these things? Who hath babbling? This is to mumble or to reveal secrets or to talk foolishly. Who hath wounds without cause? These are bruises and cuts and the person here doesn't know how they got them. Who has this? Who hath redness of eyes? They're they have, their, their eyes are dull and they're bloodshot. Who is this person that's got all these problems? That verse 29 says, look at verse 30. They that tarry long at the wine. They that go to seek mixed wine. That's the answer to all six questions. The person who tarries long at the wine, the one that goes to seek mixed wine. The one who's getting intoxicated, the one who's drunk, that's the one that's being described in verse 29. Verse 31 says this, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. And so we see here the warning about avoiding wine to the point that we don't even look at it when it starts the fermentation process, that's what it's talking about. Turning itself aright, it's mixing itself up, it's fermenting, it's producing the alcohol, it's getting more alcoholic over time as you do that, and that's how people get the alcohol, and they produce more, and some things have more alcohol content than others due to the fermentation process. But the same things that, that happen here to someone who's drinking are the same things that happen to someone who's using drugs. You could ask verse 29, you could ask all the problems. Who's got these problems? Who's got these problems? Who's got, well, the person that's letting the drugs control them. They got the same problem. But guess what? They also have the same answer. They also have the same warning about the problem. Because the drug, the person with the drugs, they think the same thing. One's not enough. One's not enough. One drink's not enough. And then the one drug's not enough. Or that one drug isn't enough and I have to go to another drug and I need that one. And the person that, that's got the drugs, they tarry long and they seek another one. Just like the person tearing long at the wine and they're seeking another drink. It's never enough for them. The drug user has the same warning to his problems. Stay away from drugs and don't look at them. That's the answer. I mean, obviously with the Lord's help, right? Stay away, don't look at it. If you got a problem with drinking, stay away. Don't look at it. If you got a problem with your flesh, whatever it is, stay away from it. Don't look at it. Get away from it. There's the problem. There's the cause. There's the warning. Just stay away from it. A newspaper article written by Dr. George C. Thostason on December 31st, listen, 1970. He said this, in light of marijuana being legalized. So it was, it was coming up to be legalized, and they've always been trying to legalize marijuana. And uh, so they want to come up and legalize it. And he wrote this. He said, the speaker at a recent meeting at the hospital was a heroin addict. He said that he had never known a single hard drug addict who hadn't started on marijuana. While marijuana has varying effects under different circumstances and with different people, the, purpose, the purposes are relaxation, a desire to make the world seem like a happy, carefree place, a means of escaping from the world of reality, to do a little visiting in a drug-induced dream world. I freely admit that a great many people who have fooled around with marijuana and never gone any further than that. But what about the person who finds that little taste of the dream world makes him want a lot more? That is the person for whom drugs, hard drugs, can be the next step, and what a long next step that is. I dare say that the legal penalties for having marijuana can, in fairness, be modified, but not of the notion of legalizing it altogether. Why? 
Because if marijuana can for some people be the step toward hard drugs, society is out of order if it takes the pos position that marijuana is all right. That's still true today. He's right. He's right. Not everybody that takes a drink of alcohol becomes uh, uh, a smoker of marijuana. But alcohol will lead you into that. Everybody that smokes marijuana doesn't, doesn't go into hard drugs. But it's definitely a gateway to it. And so legalizing marijuana is just opening the floodgates to control. Now, we're looking at a biblical truth here about anything controlling us. Okay? So God hates everything that wants to control us, that comes out of our flesh. He, want, he, he hates it all. So he's not a respecter of sin, <laughs> uh, hating one over another. He hates it all because he doesn't want anything but himself to control us. So when we talk about the biblical truth here, biblical truth never changes. It's here. Let's say it's this pulpit, it's the biblical truth. It's not going to change if uh, 2,000 years ago what's biblically true is still biblically true today. And 2,000 years from now, uh, whether that be after the millennial, millennium or whenever, it's, uh, it's not going to be changed. It's going to be the same. But inside of biblical truth, we have in our society what we call uh, moral standards. Usually what takes place is there's a biblical truth, and that biblical truth sets the temperature for moral standards. Of course, we know our churches have all went downhill on biblical truth, and their biblical truth is here now. Now, it didn't change, but they changed. So back 100 years ago, the world's moral standard was better than our church's biblical standard today. Shame on them. Shame on them then what comes out of our moral standard of society? Everybody who thinks a certain thing about biblical truth or truth as a whole, now it's all relative. There is no, um, there is no um, truth that's always true anymore. It's just whatever you want. So as we get further from the Bible, the people who are making the laws and the legal standard, well, they're far removed from the Bible. So they're making laws like legalizing marijuana and everything else because their brains are, they're all gone. They don't have a standard anymore and the churches don't have a standard anymore. So nobody knows what's going on. So now we've got laws over here that says this is right. So just because it's legal doesn't make it moral. And just because it's moral because the society says it's moral doesn't make it biblical. That's what we struggle with today. That's why, that's why the church that's still trying to live for God is seen as a dinosaur and that we've got something wrong with us. And we don't. Somebody has done, left the biblical truth and their moral standard has dropped and now the legal standard has dropped and now churches are bringing in LGBTQ pastors. There's churches now Praying to a non-binary God. Every wicked thing you can find, outward and open, because of getting away from biblical truth. But this is biblical truth and it's going to stay. Nothing's going to change it. But we have a battle because, well, it's morally okay to go get drunk. Most people would say, hey, no, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you don't get in a vehicle and drive and you don't hurt anybody else and it's all about yourself. It's okay. And if you want to do drugs, as long as you're responsible, yeah, right. Okay? And uh, it's okay. Everything's okay. Everything's okay. And that's where we get into trouble. And then things can control you because you say, well, the Bible really doesn't say well, because you're saying what this church says over here that doesn't believe the Bible. That's why the Bible doesn't say, because you ain't never read it. And this church over here is saying it's okay. But that's not what the Bible says. So we need to get back to biblical truth. And this isn't changing. We are to avoid it. We're to stay away from it. It only causes problems. Now, I want to go on. Verse 32. Uh, Proverbs 23. <clears throat> so
So we saw the problem. We saw what caused it. We saw the warning to stay away from it. Now, what does it do to us? We're going to find some things here. It does to this drunkard, what alcohol does and what drugs will do and what sin will do to us. It'll cause us some problems in our life. Verse 32, at last it, what's it? The wine. They went to seek and tarry at it and, and, and go to mixed wine. It says, at last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. So alcohol destroys our body. Alcohol destroys our body. You know, when a poisonous snake bites, he intends to kill. That's why they have venom. So they can kill their prey and then they can eat their prey. So they, they want to kill and his poison is injected into our bloodstream and it spreads with every heartbeat. Boop, 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 boop. And every time our blood goes out and comes back in, that, that poison goes all the way and it's going further and further and it's poisoning us. So our, blood, uh, our body begins to swell and our organs begin to shut down depending on how poisonous this snake is. And the only hope we have is to get the poison out or to stop it from circulating in our body. And alcohol is a poison to our bloodstream. Alcohol poisons us. I've had alcohol poisoning one time, almost died. I would have died if my best friend wouldn't have turned me over and kept me from choking on my vomit. I would have died. 17-year-old young man, maybe 16. Alcohol poisoning. Our bodies belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're to glorify him with our bodies. You say, where does that say that? Well, I'm glad you asked. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 19 and 20, the Bible says this. He's talking to the Corinthians. Now, Corinthians had some issues, had some problems. That's why he's telling them this. But they got those things right. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. <clears throat> we belong to God. Alcohol is destroying our body. Verse 33. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Alcohol impairs our judgment. It impairs our judgment. And by the way, most sin destroys our body. And most sin is, all sin is going to impair your judgment. Because you're walking in the flesh and not in the spirit. It's going to impair your judgment. Look at Proverbs 31. You say, why are we talking about the, the virtuous woman? Well, there is something before the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31. And it was words here to, to uh, King Lemuel. And look at verse 4 and 5. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. What's happening? The king's impaired judgment here. Don't be under the control of that because you're going to make the wrong decisions and people are going to take advantage of you and you're going to do the wrong thing according to people because you're not judging things right as the king. So it doesn't become you to partake of those things. You don't need to be doing those things. And alcohol was not for kings because they didn't need their judgment impaired. Have you ever wondered why business men provide alcohol to their clients? Hey, let's go out for a drink, make some business deals. Well, of course, their judgment is going to be impaired. Why, why? You ever wonder why um, men want to provide alcohol for their dates? Let's just go out and have a couple of drinks. They want that, their date to be impaired, not to be able to make the right judgment calls anymore. Why do you, you ever wonder why so many traffic accidents involve, involve a drinking driver? They're impaired. They can't react the right way. They're not alert like they ought to be uh, in a traffic situation. You ever wonder why people are so free with their money when they are drunk? Have you ever been around people that are drunk? They'll want to buy you stuff. They'll just, they're just getting their money. They don't wonder where all their money went. 
It's because they don't have any judgment. People, people do such stupid things when they're intoxicated. And by the way, most of the time we don't realize it because we're intoxicated when we're around that situation. It wasn't until after I got saved and was not intoxicated anymore that I saw people that were intoxicated. I said, I look like that. That's bad. But you never knew that because you were the same way <laughs> and everybody was impaired. It impairs your judgment. All sin is going to impair your judgment. You won't be able to tell right from wrong or wrong from right. You're going to be saying the opposite, and that's exactly what our world is doing because we have a bunch of people under the control of their flesh, and they cannot make the right judgment according to God. Look at verse uh, 34. In the beginning of verse 35. Yea, thou, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. Alcohol dulls our senses. It dulls our senses. Back over in Proverbs chapter 31, dealing with King Lemuel again, it says in verse 6, Give strong drink unto, them, unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. She said, It's not for you, king. But this is who you can give it to. And it was talking about, and the reason why is because someone's ready to perish. It was talking about how it dulls their senses to the situation that they are in. And if a man was suffering on his deathbed, they, uh, they used alcohol to ease the pain. Kind of like we give morphine today or something to help people in the time of pain or, or something of that nature. And they, you know, they offered Jesus alcohol <clears throat> before... Uh, fastening him to the cross, but he refused it. He didn't want it. I don't need it for my pain. The devil says that we have to drink to enjoy life, when in reality it hinders us from enjoying life. Every time. The devil will say that we have to drink to escape our problems, but in reality it just adds to our problems. We think we escape, but once we make the escape to be under the control of the alcohol, the drugs, or whatever sin it is that we indulge in, afterwards we have more problems than we went in with. And there's no question mark there. That's an exclamation point. That's what happens. Alcohol dulls our senses. Sin dulls our spiritual senses, and we lose our discernment in sin. Look at verse 35, the end of it here. It says, when shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Alcohol binds our will. Drugs will bind your will. Sin will bind your will in your life. Doesn't that seem foolish? Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 22. The Bible says this, His own iniquities shall take the wicked himself his own iniquities, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. The cords of sin eventually weave into a rope, and then we are bound by them. Just one sin. It's never just one sin. It leads into another sin, which leads into another sin, and it builds a rope, and the cords come around you, and then you're bound, and it binds your will. And when you think that sin is over, you wake up and you seek it again. What is wrong with that guy that is seeking to go back to the alcohol? He just got drunk last night and he's waking up with a hangover this morning in his puke. He showers off and he's ready to go back at it again. What's wrong with him? What's wrong with that drug addict that just shot up and has been up three days straight because they're wired, they crash down, and they come off of it, and they want to do it all over again? What's wrong with them? That's easy, right? Because I don't think that's any of you here. But what's hard is the sin that you deal with. And why did you do it? 
And why are you going to go back to it? Because it's only binding you. And it's binding your will. It's binding what you're actually going to do. Every time you sin, you're getting bound. And the Lord says, I don't want you under that control. I want you under my control. And my control is freedom. And my control is liberty. See, alcohol or alcoholism, which is thrown around a lot, it's not a disease. It's a sin. It's a choice. Drunkards choose to drink. Drug addicts choose to do drugs. Whatever your sin is, you choose to do it. That's what happens. It's all a choice. And it all comes out of being controlled by our flesh instead of being filled with the Spirit and the Holy Spirit controlling us. I don't know what you're bound in tonight. I don't know what's keeping you bound in imprisonment tonight. Maybe it is alcohol. Maybe it is a drug. Maybe it's something else under the power of the flesh that's keeping you bound. But I assure you that the Lord can and will forgive you and He will give you victory over it if you'll acknowledge Him, repent, confess it, come clean with God about it, and ask for His help. He will help you. The filling of the Spirit will help you, not trying to get rid of the thing, because as long as you're under the control of the flesh, it doesn't matter how much you try to get rid of it. The control of the flesh is still there. You're still bound. You have to get out from under the control of the flesh in order to be helped and have victory. No matter what our problem is, the answer is still the same, to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And then He will lead us into all righteousness. Be not drunk with wine. Wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Father, help us tonight. I don't think we've got a bunch of drunkards here or drug addicts. But Lord, what we do have is times when we let ourselves get right back underneath the control of this flesh. And this flesh is impairing us. And it's causing us problems that we would never have under your leadership and under your victory, and under your guidance in our life. And we need, to, we need to stay yielded to you. And I know you will lead us into a biblical standard of truth that is consistent in our life. And we need you to do that tonight, Lord. Would you guide us at this moment in these things? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed, altars are open. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, Brother Justin, I'm lost. I don't know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior tonight. But the Lord's dealt me about that. And if I don't get saved, I realize I'm only going to be under the control of the flesh. I won't have the Holy Spirit to help me. And tonight I realize I need Jesus Christ to save me. He died, was buried, and rose from the dead for me. And I believe that. And I know He can save me and He can help me tonight. I need that. And you say, that's me. I need to be saved tonight. Would you raise your hand and say, that's me. I'm not saved, but I need to be saved. I've never believed on Jesus as my Savior. I've been trying to do it all myself, all in my flesh. Friend, you'll never make it if that's you. You can never do enough to get to heaven. Believers, are you being controlled by the Holy Spirit? Or are you being controlled by something else? Very simple question. The Lord's already told you tonight in the service what that was. There's no way I could name everything, nor do I care to. But you know, you know what you're letting control you. Would you, would you tell that to the Lord? Would you say, Lord, I need your help tonight? I don't want anything but you to control me. And he'll help you. He's waiting to help you. He's not waiting to chastise you, although as his children, he will chastise us to get our attention. But he won't have to if you're going to bring it to him. His grace is sufficient. 
It has been. It, it is tonight. It will be tomorrow. The world's changing. Changing quickly in the past two years and more changing than I've seen in the 23 years I've been saved. But we don't have to change. We can stay right with the Bible. We can stay right with God and walk with God. Father, thank you for helping us tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for putting these things in your word that we can see them, we can acknowledge them, and that we can have faith and believe you for these things that we find in your word. Help us to, to learn how to yield to you on a consistent basis. To know your presence, to know your power, to know your control in our life, to be very present with us. Because we all need victory. We need victory tonight, right now. We need victory when we leave. And you know what the need is of each person in each person's heart. We pray you seal the things that you've done in our hearts, that we have responded correctly, and that we'll leave here better off for it tonight. And we thank you again for all that you've done for us in the death, burial, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, in our salvation through your Son, in our sanctification through your Holy Spirit in our life. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Until we meet again, take time to know the Lord and to make him known. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God bless.